Okay, we are at lecture number 11 for Intro to Literature Environment. Note that we are at part 2 of the Navigable Lecture, and we have the new improved interface by our friends at Prezi. So note too that we are here at the Renaissance. Um, if you go across here, you'll see both 11 and 12 uh, lectures are still in the Renaissance, even though 12, our next one, is going to be pointing forward. And we're still in England now as well. So let's just jump right into number 11. And zoom in a little more detail here. The program will please accommodate us. Note that we're dealing with three people this time, John Denham, Catherine Phillips, and John Milton. The first will be John Denham. By the way, both Denham and uh, Phillips are probably not familiar names to everyone, but they were incredibly popular, as we'll see in the period. Cooper's Hill is the poem that we read. It's the most popular poem that Denham did by a long shot. He kept reprinting the poem. Originally, it appeared in 1642, right before England's Civil War. 1654, the version that we're looking at, comes right after the Civil War. Um, it is a politically charged poem, even though we're interested mainly in the environmental implications of it. It is one of the most popular poems in the 17th century, uh, by a long shot, which is an aside, says a little something about the, the type of literature that we read uh, for a variety of reasons. Certain works, Milton's Paradise Lost, for example, became very canonical. They were read you know, in the centuries following it. Cooper's Hill, very popular in the period very popular through the beginning of the 19th century with Romantic writers, and then um, not so much after that. In part, the poem was popular in the period um, because it imagined the stag hunt, and you see that starting around lines 263, that in the 1654 um, version of the poem was meant to be an allegory for the killing of King Charles I. Denham was a royalist. He was, uh, you know, against the killing of the king for sure, and that is allegorized in the poem. So we've seen this before with pastoral. Keep in mind there are sometimes is environmental import, even though literally it's interesting as well. Cooper's Hill is the first modern loco-descriptive poem. Um, loco-descriptive obviously means to describe a locale. Sometimes you'll hear this poetry referred to as topographical in the sense that it is sort of a, a picture of a topos, an area. Um, but the key, ter key idea here with loco-descriptive, and one of the reasons loco-descriptive is a good term, is because it's all about description. Um, it's enormously will become enormously popular with writers such as Wordsworth, who had who read and most of the Romantics or many of them read Cooper's Hill and very much liked it and saw the importance of it. But again, keep in mind the idea here is you are, <coughs> you know, even though he's writing an allegorical poem, Denham here is literally describing a locale, and we'll talk about the sort of detail which he does that. It's interesting to note that local descriptive poems. Cooper's Hill comes on the scene right as country house poems die out, right as marvels upon Appleton House is being written. And the reason is because local descriptive is not moored to a particular estate. It's a more general purpose form of nature writing. So we saw this with um, Amelia Lanyard's The Description of Cookham, Ben Jonson's The Penshurst, <coughs> that these are they're written for a patron. As a consequence, they're sort of an over-the-top over description of a particular place, the estate owned by the patron. Because we're now entering an era where patronage is not the primary way that authors get paid for their work, they you know just generate works that are of interest that people buy as books, it's increasingly becoming the case that they, they don't have to worry about um, making, it, making a patron happy, talking about their particular property that they own. They could talk about any property anywhere. And when they do that, it suddenly sort of opens up all of England for, for discussion or to, to be sort of the, um, the center or uh, interest of poetry. <coughs> Returning to pastoral, which we've talked about again and again, it, local descriptive literature is a form of pastoral poetry in general terms. 
sometimes it, it won't have the conventions of pastoral poetry we're used to, you know, the inclusion of sheep and shepherds, but it is definitely meant to, pa to gesture toward the environment. And, you know, we saw already uh, 50 years before this that Shakespeare is beginning to play with pastoral, beginning to question its modes, beginning to make reflections on it. So as a consequence, people will not always, you know, want to write in this sort of older pastoral mode, literally, but they're still very much interested in gesturing toward and writing about the environment. It's interesting to note <coughs> that Cooper's Hill gestures to a variety of environments. So if you if you stand on the top of Cooper's Hill, and keep in mind, I'll talk about this a little more in a moment, that the poem, even though it's called Cooper's Hill, we never actually get to see Cooper's Hill. Cooper's Hill is this vantage point. You are placed up on top of Cooper's Hill by the poet uh, Denham, and you are imagining and you are seeing this sort of panoramic spread out before you. This is why, incidentally, it's much more expensive than a pastor than a country estate poem because you know those estates, no matter how big, are relatively small compared to this view that Denham is going to give you. And you look down and you see St Paul's Cathedral, which is in London. So you're actually looking at the distance of London. You're looking at Windsor Castle. Castle, St. Anne's Hill, you're looking at the Thames, Windsor Forest, a Washland Meadow, and so forth. This is a remarkably expansive panorama. And fitting, I think, that the um, local descriptive poem starts with this because it shows you immediately you know, the power of the, the vehicle that you can describe so much more than, than ever would be described in the sort of the provincial um, country estate poem. It's interesting, though, that unlike Denham, most loco descriptive poets, and I'm thinking of here like people like Wordsworth, will ignore urban areas, as they instead looked and fetishized more pristine environments. So, in that sense, in a way, Denham is is both a harbinger of the loco descriptive poem, as well as um, he hasn't it, it it doesn't have all the characteristics that it will later have, i.e., sort of a fetishization of nature. But, but as far as I'm concerned, that makes it all the more interesting because you actually see Denham doing here um, uh, what maybe other poets should have done, which is to look at all sorts of landscapes um, from an environmental point of view. So this is the view um, from Cooper's Hill as it would have appeared to Denham. So Windsor Castle is here. You can see it. It's it's you know the largest thing, and note that you are up on a hill here. You can sort of see the the topography here that you've been placed up here. London would have been seen in the distance here, and as a consequence, you know um, this poem is called a hill poem. The genre would have been known as a hill poem genre. So if you were to ask Wordsworth what was Cooper's Hill, he wouldn't have said a local descriptive poem. You would have said ah, it's a, it's the hill it's a hill poem. It inaugurated this new genre in the same way that um, the description of Cookham and Penshurst inaugurated the genre of the country house, or more accurately, the country estate poem. This inaugurated the hill poem, and there would be hundreds of these written in the next 150 years or so. Very popular. So, moving from Hooper's Hill to more generally talking about loco descriptive literature and what it does, uh, loco descriptive literature. Moving here is often, and this shouldn't come as a very as a big surprise, very descriptive. So, if you're trying to you know to capture a locale, you know whether you're doing it between the boards of a book or if you're a painter on canvas, you'll need to increasingly give a more vivid description of it, and and that's what's going to be happening here. As a consequence, these works are going to become more and more representational. Description is going to be on the rise throughout this period. I'll explain that in a little more detail. So. If you look closely at classical, medieval, or early Renaissance pastoral, including to Penshurst, um, look for the descriptions of the environment there. We call this, you know, in literature, mimesis. It's a Greek term, it literally means representation. If you look at for the descriptions of the environment in to Penshurst, you're going to see them, but they're pretty few and far between, and they're certainly not very lush descriptions. These works instead gesture to the environment at hand, but they're familiar in nearby environments. 
And this is a major difference between local descriptive and earlier works like country estate poems. What I mean by this is simple. If you're describing a scene, uh, you know, part of the landscape that someone would have known, and if you're a patron, if this is your estate, you know it very well. Well, that's a very different job than describing something like a, um, a scene in England in the Lake District where your reader may never have viewed that at all. So, on the one hand, you know, both cases you're gesturing toward the environment, you're trying to get the, the person to see the environment in a certain kind of way. But if you're very familiar with the, your, your own estate, you don't need the same sort of description or the same way of approaching this that you would if you didn't know the estate at all. So if the reader, in this case uh, a patron, in, in the case of Johnson and Lanyard, can actually visit the locale, then representation, and by that in a literary sense I mean description, is less important. So here's what I mean by that. In this sense, to Penshurst doesn't need to lavishly describe the scene in a way to make you imagine it for someone who has never seen it at all. So in that sense, Penshurst is like a nature guide, like a human guide walking beside you. And every turn, these are the lines from the poem. Look, there's the broad beach and the chestnut. Look, the purple pheasant with the speckled sides. Look, the painted partridge lies in every field. In this sense, you know, you don't have to go into great descriptions about what the, you know, the painted partridge or the purple pheasant is going to look like. If you had never visited this scene, if you, in fact, had never seen a partridge or a pheasant, if you're an urban dweller, then you may need a lot of description. Um, by the time we get, uh, you know, to the next century, the 18th century, people are going to be doing more and more of that. So Alexander Pope in Windsor Forest will describe a bird, in fact, a bird dying, a pheasant in great, great detail, because you're not there to see it because you're not there to see it, the author has to provide it for you. That's not the case in Penshurst, because you're there to see it. You just need someone to draw attention to it, to say, you know, you live in a really great estate. Look at those trees over there. They are so beautiful. If you actually stop to pay attention to those trees, in that sense, it's similar to, you know, what Meliboas was doing in Virgil's first Eclogue. He wanted Titerus to be aware of something. He was trying to draw his attention to it even as late as you know, Ben Johnson's to Penshurst and Cookham, Lanyard's Cookham, that's what they're doing. That will be a different project from the poets that are going to become after, though. So, if you think about it, if you're actually, if, you, if, if your reader, in this case a patron, actually knows the estate, you know, giving lush descriptions of it is not going to be particularly helpful. It's sort of like, you know, the last thing you need is if you're walking through a, um, uh, an estate would be to have a nature guide standing beside you and the guide saying instead of, look at that beautiful, you know, strand of trees over there, would be to start going into lavish, you know, over-the-top description. Look how beautiful the mottled leaves are and the veins in them. And you know, just it, it could be intrusive because what you really want to do is have a direct experience of the natural world of the environment yourself, and you know, having someone inter you know intercede between you and it would be kind of you know uh, um, problematic. You know, so, <clears throat> but again, that would be different if. Well, yeah, if the nature guide succumbs to lavishly describing, not only superfluous, it would risk being counterproductive. And I think that's absolutely right. But again, remember that your nature guide here is the poet. It is not at all counterproductive later if you've never seen the scene. You need to be able to sort of close your eyes and imagine it, and we're going to rely on our poets to, to give us that description. And the way they give it to us is by giving us more and more description, sort of layering on detail. And we're going to see that for the rest of the term. Consequently, literature from the early modern period onward, and really from Cooper's Hill, this is a great sort of inaugural point, becomes more and more representational and less gestural. Um, Cooper's point, you can actually visit this scene, but you know, not everyone is going to uh, Cooper's Hill, but not everyone is going to climb up to Cooper's Hill, so increasingly the role of the poet is going to be to see things for us and then to describe them in a way so that we can imagine them without ever actually going there ourselves. 
And if you think about it then, local descriptive poetry attempts to create an environment in their text. Maybe that's a little strong. Not create, at least we hope to emulate an environment in the text. Now whether they succeed or not is debatable, but the, the idea here is that they want to, you know, give you a, a text that that sort of stands in for the environment. It describes the environment. You may never get a chance to visit it, but you can still close your eyes and imagine it. And in the way, we're not going to be, we're not far off, you know, just 20 or 25 years off from something like Milton's Paradise Lost, which really takes this up. And the descriptions, and you've already read, um, Book Four of Paradise Lost are, by comparison, at least to the Renaissance and what came before, incredibly lush and detailed. And why is that? Well, obviously, no one can visit Eden. Eden is lost. So the poet's job is not like to be a nature guide describing how you could walk through Eden and what you would see, because no one gets to do that. But now we have to recreate Eden. We have to literally create an environment between the boards of a book. In the book itself, the environment has to reside. In the case of Eden, it resides nowhere but there, which puts an incredible obligation on the author to be able to describe it. So this is not just the case with the, uh, the art of poets, but, poet, but art more generally, especially visual arts. And it's worth noting that our word landscape first appears right around the year 1600. And again, this is where Johnson, Lanier, and Shakespeare are writing. Um, actually, it comes out of Dutch. It means it's literally landscape, the first word. So artists become increasingly interested in the landscape and its successful representation. This becomes a, a big project for them. So moving away from local descriptive to our second part and here we're going to look at some visual depictions of landscape to show you what I mean and the reason here is um, while we're looking at these think about how this project of visually representing the landscape is paralleled uh, by artists by poets so this is the hunt of the unicorn this is the year 1500 this is from our point of view as I mentioned you know where the the English Renaissance begins. This is a scene set out in a forest, right? So these are trees here. There's actually a tree running here. Um, but things to note. First, the trees are so small by comparison to the human scene. Um, this is, you know, is, is very anthropocentric in that sense. The humans are much larger than the forest. The forest is there is just sort of backdrop to let you know that this is a forest, but it's really uh, not much else important. The tree that goes up here is meant to be symbolic. It sort of splits the scene into two. So not only is the, the forest unimportant on sort of a literal level, it's also made to function allegorically for different reasons. And, and that's going to be pretty common in this period. The main thing, though, is the environment, just not very important. And from the point of view of, of depicting it, this is not meant to be a very accurate depiction at all of the environment. Um, this is the crucifixion of St. Peter with the donor. This is a little earlier. Again, is the environment here? Sure. It's, it's kind of meant to be like literal, like crags in the way it's, it's depicted here. But again, very allegorical. You have, you know, a church here. You have a city, a town here. You have this road symbolically cutting the scene in two. And again, the human presence is huge here, very you know anthropocentric. It's not very important that the environment, um, you know, it's not the environment's not meant to be literal, and it's not very important here. I mean, this is about human beings. It's about allegorical significance of the church here and all. This doesn't have much to do with the environment. So that's sort of the the baseline where we're going to start. But when landscape, landscape first comes on the scene with Dutch uh, painters and Peter Bruegel, the elder would be an example, suddenly the landscape is going to take on a new importance. S 1565, a little later than what we just saw, but wow, what a difference. 
and they're trying the author the painter here is trying to accurately represent an environment there's a sense of perspective here um, if you look at the you know the way the weed is actually being uh, cut here and all much more realistic also um, note this is a Georgic scene um, that you know th this is meant to to actually describe what you know, country workers are doing, this guy looks pretty pretty tired here. Uh, people are actually stopping to eat during, you know, probably having lunch during the the cutting of the, the harvesting of the wheat. But it's meant to be literal, and increasingly now, you know, this is uh, a post Leonardo da Vinci world where perspective is now increasingly being understood. So a variety of tools that that artists have been accruing are going to be brought to bear on this, and yeah. Um, a way of thinking of this is we're trying to get something more and more like um, photographic realism here with the way it's described. By the 1640s and 50s, and again, 1640s and 50s are the decades when Denham was writing and rewriting Cooper's Hill. Um, Claude Lorraine, this is a French artist, is beginning to do things like this. This is near photographic fidelity to reality. This is meant to depict a scene exactly the way it looks, not the way that, um, it, without any sort of great allegorical reference. Notice too that the human presence is so much smaller. If we compare this to the hunt of the unicorn where human beings were like this tall by comparison, the human presence is shrinking. These works are, are less and less anthropocentric, more sort of biocentric. Um, it's meant to depict a landscape and, and to, to see a human presence in a certain kind of way here. So <clears throat> note of course what we had here the the you know the he large human presence is here and all and suddenly in Claude Lorraine human presence is just very different I mean 100 150 years 200 years separates these two works but what you know what has happened here um, increasingly the environment is being centered anthropocentrism is being questioned and increasingly we want to to give the the person viewing the artwork the experience of being there so this is meant to be like a photograph it's meant to be like if you were actually there at the scene this is what it would be like you 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 know you have you need never to have visited this scene and that's part of what Lorraine wants to do um, he wants to take you there and he sees that as his job it's irrelevant if you've ever visited and maybe better not because then you know you get to see it exactly the way that he wanted you to see it so this is going to be the case in the period where we are with Denim um, in England especially um, as the you know the actual life and practices of the British people began to dominate the environment more and more human beings and especially poets are going to question whether we should do that they're going to question that project so anthropocentrism um, is going to be be questioned and, and the way things are going to be portrayed will will show that so the way of thinking about this is what Denham begins introducing to poetry is what Lorraine and others did to painting the desire to create a highly successful representation of the environment so from the middle of the 17th century onward with Denham and others. And poets are going to increasingly strive for that sort of photographic realism in their work. Description is going to be what that's going to be about. So for Denham, or for um, Claude Lorraine, who did that very photographically realistic painting, you know, he's going to have to spend a lot of time doing, you know, details, getting, you know, individual branches and leaves and perspective and the sun and everything just right. Poets, similarly, are going to have to use more and more description to get everything right. They're just going to have to lay on the description and layer it more throughout their work. At times, then, poetic description will approach something like scientific writing. And, and that's actually something that, that literary critics have looked at, the difference between detailed scientific writing and poets who are lavishing description trying to describe something. This we'll see, and it sort of reaches a, a, a pinnacle with Thoreau, especially in his later works and his journals after Walden, um, because he considered himself as much a writer um, as a naturalist. So when he describes leaves, he describes them with incredible detail, the way a naturalist would describe, you know, taxonomy and and where a leaf fits into things. So 
in that sense, you know, the power of these projects of description are going to parallel the scientific writing, and yet poets are going to have to and will diverge off into their own direction. So <coughs> that's loco descriptive poetry. I want to move to Johnson's Praise of a Country Life and Phillips' um, A Country Life. We've read both of these. Um, they're both translations of Horace's second epode. Horace is a contemporary of, rough contemporary of Ovid and Virgil. We didn't read him because, you know, even though his second epode is interesting, because we have two great translations of it in the Renaissance, one by Johnson coming from the beginning of the 17th century, one by Catherine Phillips coming at the end of the or middle of the I guess third quarter of the second of the 17th century, and the contrast between those two translations is interesting, and it tells us something about shifting ways of imagining the environment in the 17th century. So Horace, um, his second epode seemingly begins with a celebration of country life, you know, and these are the very famous lines. Every bit as famous in some ways as the beginning of Virgil's first eclogue, which he read. Happy the man who far from business cares, like the pristine race of mortals, works his ancestral acres with his steers from all money lending free. So this is clearly in a, you know, a, a clear reference to the golden age, pristine race of mortals. He's free from business cares. Um, this word would have in the Renaissance when this is being translated here by Ben Johnson, um, still uh, um, echoed the original uh, sense of business, like busyness. You know, he's, it's not, he's, he's not um, taken up by business concerns, by being busy with the natural world, by being busy with the cares of people. Instead, he lives a life of odium, you know. He, this is land that he's had for many years. It's ancestral land. It's the locus aminus, you know, complete with odium, um, and also suggestive of the golden age. So you would think that Virgil is just going to enlist himself in the same tradition that we saw started with Hesiod, celebration of the golden age. <clears throat> By its end, however, and it's such an interesting poem to look at, we realize this is all constructed, or it's coming from the perspective of the city and being seen as just the opposite of the city. So these are the ending lines. When the money lender Alpheus had uttered this on the very point of beginning the farmer's life, he called on all his funds by the end of the month, and next month seeks to put them out again. So you find out that the person idealizing this country life, the lines that we just read at the beginning, seeing this as all being so perfect, is in fact someone in the city, a money lender, someone who, you know, has no connection with the land, no connection with farmer's life, is just entirely idealizing this, and he's preparing to go out and live a farmer's life because he finds it so so um so appealing. He's gonna call all his money in to get it so together so he could go buy a farm, but then of course he decides that he'll continue to be a money lender and it will never change. And it's you know Horace's way of saying that and drawing attention tongue-in-cheek way that this idea of a golden pastoral age you know in pastoral literature is just something constructed by people living in the city and constructed I mean just the opposite of the city so it's um, it's it's an acknowledgement by Horace that the country life is is not perfect but is a constructed ideal and he's fully aware that the rural countryside around Rome at this time is not a locus aminus but is culturally constructed specifically from the vantage point of the city and Horace you know just enjoys making a parody of this but it does draw into uh, relief here, the fact that, of course, not everyone, even very early in the game, 2,000 years ago, bought into the idea of a rural locus aminus. What's interesting is that Johnson's translate Horace's second epode um, and proves that he understands the poem. You know, it's a line by line translate, line by line translation. It's it's you know Johnson follows um, Horace in in you know, making the dream of the, the pastoral life very clear, and he also makes sure it's uttered at the end by the uh, the money lender, Alpheus. So Johnson gets it. Johnson gets that this is a parody of pastoral. He knows the country life really isn't like that, and he wants to, you know, communicate that full meaning in his translation. 
Phillips, writing in 1667, um, actually leaves off the ending. And what she does is a highly stylized translation of Horace the Second Epode, and it doesn't reveal that it is a parody. So imagine if you had just continued in the same vein as the opening passage we read, and you just made it one more, you know, beautiful over the top description of how wonderful country life is. That's what Catherine Phillips does. And it's interesting why she sets out to do that and what's going on there. So let's jump to um, to our friend Catherine Phillips and A Country Life. And again, that's just her um, title for her translation of Horace's the second epoch. So at the beginning, it's great to note that Catherine Phillips is one of the most popular women writers in 17th century England. We noted at the very beginning of the 17th century in England that Amelia Lanier becomes perhaps the first professional woman writer in, in England. Catherine Phillips is a very popular one. And the reason for that is she knows just what to say and what not to say. So, for example, she constructs herself as a woman in a very sort of unthreatening way. So she writes poems celebrating um, having children and why being a mother is such a wonderful thing, why being a wife is such a wonderful thing. Um, very non-threatening. Um, people liked her poetry for that reason. Again, she's enormously popular. Someone like Margaret Cavendish, a near contemporary of hers, coming a little before, I guess, um, is not that. Uh, she very much um, wants to say what she wants. She's outspoken. She at times can, can seem sort of um, male in her approach, and people found it threatening. Catherine Phillips knew just what to say. She knew just what line to walk. And um, we know she's a far more interesting person than the sort of single, non-threatening persona she represents. But she knew that to be influential, she had to, to present herself a certain way at that time. Uh, and she also understood very clearly um, that attitudes toward the environment were changing in that period in England. And as a consequence, she gave her reader what they increasingly wanted. And again, remember this is an urban reader at the very end of the Renaissance period in England that we're talking about, especially when London has become this, you know, environmental mess because of things like um, excessive air pollution, uh, overpopulation, and other things. So while Horace and Johnson um, knew that the portrayal of countryside was a culturally constructed illusion, they all did, and Phillips did as well. I mean, she read the ending of Horace, the second epode, she understood what it meant. She uh, instead faced with this sort of increasing environmental devastation, gave the reader what they wanted. She pulled the end off of the of Horace's second epode. Her readers wanted to sort of transport themselves to a, a perfect imagined place. She's going to let them do it. She's going to, you know, not reveal that Horace is making a parody of this attitude. I mean, why would she want to do that? Because she herself is going to enlist herself in this tradition of an over-the-top description of the environment from an urban point of view. That's what her readers want it. That's what her readers were doing, the sort of escapism, trying to imagine nature in the natural world as a, as a, you know, a panacea for all their problems. She's not going to disabuse them of the idea the way that Horace did, the way that Johnson did. So when you read uh, her description, and again, her description is becoming more and, and more descriptive. And what I mean by that is Horace's second epode is not that long of a poem. She actually, Catherine Phillips, actually adds 20 lines of, over 20 lines of additional description. You know, she talks about country folk who do not rule over anyone. You know, they do not envy anyone else's wealth. They don't eat animals. They like Thoreau, live in simple cottages. They are in every way opposed to the city and the state. Some of this is coming right from Horace. A lot of it Catherine Phillips is embellishing. She wants to describe the country scene, the simple country life, as pretty darn perfect, as a real locus aminus. Increasingly now, in this period, and this is going to continue like a juggernaut through the 18th century and into the 19th with Romantic poets like Thoreau in, in England, in America rather, we are going to see the description of the natural world as being wonderful and amazing and everything that the city isn't. And Catherine Phillips begins doing it here through this translation of Horace, which is thoroughly and completely ironic because even, you know, 2,000 years ago, Horace knew that this was all constructed 
culturally constructed an illusion what people wanted to see. Catherine Phillips, again, a master of giving people what they want, gave them what they wanted. And what they wanted was a perfect view of country life, and that's what she does. She is a harbinger of a generation of poets. Um, and these poets are not only going to celebrate, um, you know, from the vantage point of the city, the countryside, they're going to in, uh, encourage, they themselves are going to actually move out into the countryside, encourage people to literally do it. So Wordsworth is, is, is probably more influential than anyone in encouraging people to, to, to just, you know, fantasize and idealize the country life, in his case, the Lake District around Grashmere. Uh, the little village of Grashmere in the Lake District in England, and he wants people to think that this is really wonderful. And he moves out there because he himself seems to buy into it, and then he becomes horrified that in mass people begin to follow him out into the countryside. He actually begins to fight against tourism to the Lake District and fight against specifically a rail line that was being built there in the, the second half of the 19th century. So it's it's very much going to this this project of idealizing nature in the natural world in places that are seemingly as different from the city as possible this is actually going to help bring about a cultural movement that people will literally actually do it we will see this again and again this term this is going to happen in the united states the the the, the colonization of the united states seeing north america as a pastoral locus i mean is depicting it that way will encourage you know millions of people to move here people will want to leave the city after the Second World War for the same reason. They imagined life out in the suburbs is better. In the 1990s especially, they want to leave the suburbs, which they're no longer happy with because they imagined life out in the rural countryside and small town America better. All of this is fueled by and made possible by this, this essentially, broadly speaking, pastoral project of depicting you know, rural places, uh, wilderness places, as a wonderful locus of meanness that people would want to move to. Catherine Phillips is an early and I think wonderful example of that um, that project of doing so. So, get to Milton's Paradise Lost. I have two dates here because it's first published in 1667 and then reprinted, uh, republished in a slightly modified version with 12 instead of 10 books in 1674. It is, of course, a reinscription, a retelling of the um, the story of the first three books of Genesis, which, if you read them, um, they're very small. Uh, so he takes this, Milton does this brief account of Genesis, and this, of course, is the story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and he expands it into over 10,000 lines of poetry, and he provides a radical retelling of this story. It's incredibly imaginative on Milton's part, and in it he weighs in on a whole range of things, the notion of the Trinity, the free will, the notion of free will, the nature of God, the nature of women, sex, labor, work, uh, you name it, it's, it's huge. Um, and a host of other topics, but from our point of view, environmentally, Paradise Lost is interesting too. Again, remember the date, 1667-1674, it's coming at the end of the Renaissance, and this is a time where um, environmentally a whole host of problems were, were popping up throughout England. So, Milton's Eden is a locus of Venus, but it's interesting that Adam and Eve actually garden there. They do work there. So if you remember from our reading of Genesis 3, 17 and 19, the punishment that Adam has essentially is Georgic labor. He has to work for um, his living and sort of take from the earth because of the uh, original sin. As a consequence, in nearly every account of the fall between uh, Genesis and Milton, um, Adam and Eve do no work in the Garden of Eden because, you know, work is punishment. And furthermore, since Eden had been sort of uh, merged with pastoral literature in in, in many of the depictions, um, this goes against odium too, right? You know, pastoral is odium. It's life where you don't work. Milton has them gardening in the Garden of Eden. And as a consequence, this is just one indication of many from Paradise Lost in Milton's writings more generally, that Milton is a proponent, like Al Gore, of the Christian stewardship approach to the planet, which entrusts the care of the earth to human beings. So Milton reads the, all the passages that we looked at uh, when we when we 
to Genesis about you know human being are there to trust and you know to tend the garden and to take care of it and all. He sees all that as meaning that they're in Adam and Eve you know, stand in for all human beings, are entrusted by God to take care of the planet, that we are stewards of the planet, that's what we have to do. Milton believes, you know, wants to drive that point home so much so that he takes the radical, uh, essentially, uh, um, you know, interpretation of scripture here, where he's saying that even before the fall, that's what we were to do. It's not a punishment for the fall, that's always been what human beings have been about, to take care of the planet. Um, Milton also portrays Eve as the genus Loki of Eden. We saw how important genus Loki figures have been from the very beginning with Hombaba in the myth of Gilgamesh. Well, now suddenly we have the the genus Loki not being a monster. And I, won't, I should say shouldn't say suddenly. This has been happening for four thousand years, but suddenly now, suddenly now, human beings are the genus Loki's themselves. If you look at what Eve does, she nurses the plants in her, her domain. She sees to the beauty of Eden. She protects the place from nightly ill. She attends to Eden with morning haste. You know, every day she gets out early and goes taking care of plants and all. And you know, this is Milton saying that this is what human beings are. Human beings are entrusted by God to take care of the garden, to take care of the planet. This is before the fall happened. This is the way that if everything had gone, you know, according to plan, without original sin, this is how life would have, what life would have been like on earth. It would have been amazing, and it would have been uh, a, a time of work where human beings carefully, you know, took care of the earth and saw themselves as stewards of the planet. Milton also deconstructed the notion that Christianity was inherently dualist. So if you remember back, I think it was lecture five or so, we had that you know, long you know, dividing line across the screen where everything above was metaphysical, everything below was the physical. And we noted how in you know, Judeo-Christian as well as the Greco-Roman with Plato and all, that there's this tradition of dualism in the West. And that, that, of course, has environmental problems because if we're thinking entirely about the, you know, the metaphysical realm, the supernatural being better than the physical, what does that mean about how we you know, treat the physical and how we live here? In any event, Milton would have none of this. He was a monist. He believed that human beings were split between um, beings of spirit and neither, neither believed that human beings were split beings of spirit or flesh, nor that the earth and heaven were fundamentally different. Milton says in Paradise Law, Gloss that everything is one first matter all. What he means by that is not only is sort of the you know the spirit and flesh of a human being all one matter, so is earth, so is heaven. Everything is composed of the same exact thing. You know, think of this as a, as a scientific theory of matter. And Milton is saying, well, yes, there is a spiritual aspect of human beings, but guess what? It's composed of the same matter as the physical aspect of human beings. Yes, there is a physical planet Earth, but guess what? It is composed of the same exact matter as heaven, which is also a physical place. There is no dualism here to Milton. Everything is just one matter connected. There is no separation between spirit and... I mean, you can talk about spirit and flesh as being different, and Milton does. You can talk about heaven and Earth being different. They're different places. But at the end of the day, you know, in, in, a, in a sort of scientific theory, they're all composed of the same stuff. There is no dualism here, there's just one matter. And Milton then wants to erase the boundary between the physical and metaphysical. He does this, you know, repeatedly in Paradise Lost and elsewhere. And to Milton, it's a staggering thought, a staggering uh, um, statement that he believes this is not inherent in Christianity. We saw, of course, with, you know, Judeo-Christian, I mean, Greco-Roman thinking like Plato, where this is clearly the case. Milton reads the Bible, he looks for indications of it, he's just not seeing it. He believes that you can read the Bible and be entirely faithful to it and still be a monist. Where then does this tradition come from? Milton says, yeah, well, if it's not from Christianity, it's from the fact that Christianity has merged with this other tradition, and this is sort of Greco-Roman you know, thinking. And, in fact, Milton, you know, not only subscribes and likes monism and thinks that it's the way it is, he then makes central 
in Paradise Lost parody of dualism. So it's not enough that he rejects dualism, he actually wants to make fun of it. The, some of the most famous lines from Paradise Lost are uttered by Satan. Satan, when he's in hell, says, you know, this is a really bad place, hell. I mean, it's really bad. But it doesn't matter, because the mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. Um, many people have read these lines very approvingly. You know, if you're in a really horrible position, like in prison, and that's in essence where Milton Satan is in hell, then, you know, you can sort of imagine yourself somewhere better. You can take even that hellish place and imagine it as heaven and get there. Um, it's, in a way, the boast of a metaphysical thinker because at the the greatest extreme of that you can you know you can imagine yourself as a spiritual being in another place and sort of inhabit that intellectually it doesn't really matter where you are at the time um, Milton's contemporary the French philosopher René Descartes will um, be propound this of course this becomes mind-body dualism in a modern in an early modern uh, philosophical sense really gets kicked off in a big way with Descartes but again it's this dualistic thinking and Milton has sort of Descartes walking around in Paradise Lost, or at least an aspect of Satan in Paradise Lost is Descartes. This notion that, you know, it doesn't really matter where you are, the place doesn't matter because you are somehow separated from all this in a spiritual sense, that, you know, intellectually, as mind, you are, you are separated from it. Keep in mind, of course, environmentally, this is kind of a problem, right? I mean, in other words, we live in a place environmentally, um, we should be connected to the place. Milton goes further. He says we should be stewards of the place. We should take care of the place and all. And if we're not, then, you know, we're we're sort of abandoning our connection to the earth. We're saying it doesn't really matter. And, and it really is what Satan is saying here. You know, the mind is its own place. Why does place matter? Why does this place matter, the place we inhabit? Why should we be a steward of it? Place doesn't matter. The mind is its own place. It can make itself whatever it wants. So, Milton, you know, enjoys having Satan boast of that in hell, telling about how important, the, you know, that the mind is and it, it, the place doesn't matter. But by the time Milton, Satan actually gets to Paradise Lost, and this is book four, which we read, he realizes the horrible truth of it all, that which way I fly is hell, myself from hell. So Milton here is scoffing at those thinkers like Satan and by extension Descartes, who said that the mind, believed that the mind could pull free of the body, the earth, and indeed the entire physical realm. You can't. If you're someone like Satan, the notion of separating yourself from a place isn't going to work. You can go wherever you want to. You are still who you are, and you still carry that with you. So, again, the notion here is that we should be connected to place. We should not try to pull ourselves free of it. And um, we should not try to separate ourselves from uh, um, our bodies, you know. So to Milton, you do not reside in your body. You're not like a, a soul that's in a vessel, sort of like in a, in a jar or something. But you are your body. It's not like you can, you shouldn't even talk about your body as being different than who you are because you are your body. And Milton goes even further, and this is pretty extraordinary. You do not live in a place in the same way you are the place. It doesn't to Milton, it doesn't make sense to talk of yourself, talk about yourself as separate from the body or the place, because as one matter, all we are all connected with everything. I mean, it's just the way it is. So Milton not only erases the boundary between mind and body, and that you know erases the sort of dualism of. of the dualistic aspect of human beings that we've been repeatedly seeing in the course, but he also does it between mind and place. The mind is, and this is counter to Satan, its place, wherever it is, you know, be it heaven, be it hell or earth, you know, we are that place. And his shining example of this is Eve, his Eve in Paradise Lost, who, you know, does not live in a place, or not just live in a place, she is that place, she is intimately connected, and we'll, we'll see more of this next time as well. But I should note that obviously um, Milton is interpreting 
the Judeo-Christian Bible very differently than Dunn. We saw last lecture that Dunn argued that the world is but a carcass and urges us to forget this world and scarce think of it as of old clothes cast off a year ago. But Milton, you know, eschewing both mind, body, and, and physical metaphysical dualism, um, argued for the possibility of regenerative Christian error here and now on earth. So what this means, of course, is that Dunn interprets Christianity and done as a dualist, at least uh, in the persona of this um, anniversary that we read, that, you know, the earth and everything in it should be forgotten. We are, we are separate and apart from it. We are spirit. We are going to be, you know, uh, living with God after we're resurrected. So there's no reason to think about the earth, the environment. Forget about it. It's like old clothes cast off a year ago. But you know, Dun Milton is not of that mind. He argues that not only is there no difference between the mind and the body, there's no difference between the mind and place. We're all one matter, all. And Milton goes even further, we'll see some of this next lecture, in arguing for the possibility of regenerative Christian era here and now on earth. So remember in the poem, Dunn sort of alluded to the fact that people were talking about the carcass's last resurrection, the fact that the earth could be regenerated and, and actually be resurrected, that, that a tipping point had not been reached 6,000 years ago. That yes, a catastrophic thing had happened with the original sin, but there was still there would still be the possibility that human beings could, through, you know, through slow and careful labor, regenerate the earth and make it better. You know, that carcass's last resurrection they can bring it about. Well, here with Milton, we have an example of somebody who does believe that, and we're going to see it um, next lecture as we look more into Paradise Lost. But I did want to note before we, uh, we finish that this debate between Dunn and Milton um, does not you know, end in the 17th century. The question, and in some ways it's one of the most important questions of the uh, the 21st century, and that is, is paradise lost? In other words, did we, you know, reach a, re a point where, where a tipping point has been reached where the earth cannot be regenerated and saved? Is paradise lost? Was paradise lost never to be regained again? So in 2007, a uh, number of prominent Christian activists, led by a guy named James C. Dobson, who is founder of a group called Focus on the Family, they called on the National Association of Evangelicals to dismiss an individual who urged that, was referred to at the time as global warming, be taken seriously. Um, to Dobson, the Earth reached a tipping point 6,000 years ago. It's now in an irretrievable uh, state of decay. There's really no reason to take you know, um, global warming seriously because paradise is now lost. I mean, it's it's not going to be saved. It's not something that we have to think about. Well, that's sort of the John, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, yeah, the John Dunn version of things that, you know, the earth is a carcass, it's dead, why worry about it? Dobson is suggesting otherwise. But of course, you know, in here, just like in, in Dunn's poem, embedded the idea that there's someone else, in this case I mentioned an official from the National Association of Evangelicals, who takes another position. Um, there are many people who take the other position, and of course the biggest one is Al Gore. Um, and he is calling for extraordinary efforts to regenerate the planet. So this debate then continues, um, even in a Christian context, right? On the one hand, you have Dunn and John Dobson. The earth is destroyed, decaying, forget about it. It's like old clothes. We should not take it seriously. Other people like Milton and Al Gore very devoutly Christian, very thoughtful Christian, saying that, you know, we need to regenerate the planet. It's not a debate that um, that ever ends, really. And in, in some sense, although it's fascinating to see it playing out in the, the middle and the uh, of the um, 17th century, it's playing out today in the second decade of the 21st century. Um, and the stakes in many ways are even, are even bigger now than they, they were then. Okay, so that will conclude lecture number 11. We will pick up again with Milton next time, and lecture 12 will also finish up um, the Renaissance for us. Okay.